right. Well, as uh, folks uh, continue to enter into the Zoom webinar, I want to welcome you all to uh, the kickoff session for the Expanding Empathy Speaker Series here at the Rock Ethics Institute. Uh, this is our fourth year running the series. Uh, and this year, I am extremely excited by a new format that we're trying. Uh, my co-organizer is Dr. Martina Orlandi, a, a postdoc in Engaged Ethics at the Rock Ethics Institute and Schreier Honors College member of the EMP lab here at Penn State. And you know, one of the, the goal of the series is to highlight cutting edge research on how we think about ethics and morality. Um, and one of the key themes of the Rock Ethics Institute is interdisciplinary conversations, bringing people together from different disciplines to see different approaches on topics uh, in morality and ethics. And so this year, Martina and I thought that we'd really try to exemplify that through the format. And so we're gonna have each of four panels over the next four weeks that are pairing a prominent philosopher and psychologist to talk about a common theme. Uh, this week's theme is on the ethics uh, and science and ethics of online emotion, so just outrage. And we'll have a pair of talks that really uh, dive into that topic. The format uh, is each speaker will give about a 25, 30 minute talk, after which there'll be a few questions and answers from the audience. Um, after that, after each talk, we'll then sort of segue into a more organic conversation where the speakers can talk about each other's work and we'll take have plenty of time for questions from the audience. Uh, we have until 5 p.m. So uh, we'll just sort of see how it goes. Uh, before we get started, I do want to thank, in addition to The Rock, uh, the Departments of Psychology and Philosophy, as well as the Social Science Research Institute and the Edna Bennett Pierce Prevention Research Center, all of whom have helped provide some additional support to make this year's format possible. Um, one other thing before we get started, before we introduce, um, if after this panel, you're really interested in more, we're gonna host on May 2nd, a meeting of the Moral Agency Workshop in which we'll have uh, doctors uh, Norlock and Crockett join us for a more informal, casual conversation uh, for about an hour on Zoom. If you want a chance to talk more about some of the topics you learned about today. And also, uh, Martina has been organizing um, a podcast where she's interviewing each of the panelists for this series, uh, a short, you know, 10 minute podcast that really gives you a sense for how each of the speakers got into the research they're interested in and what they find uh, compelling about this work. All right, so without further ado, let me introduce uh, Dr. Molly Crockett, uh, who is an associate professor of psychology at Yale University and distinguished research fellow at the Oxford Center for Neuroethics. Um, before being at Yale, Dr. Crockett was an associate professor of experimental psychology at the University of Oxford and a fellow of Jesus College. Dr. Crockett holds a Bachelor of Science in Psychobiology from UCLA and a PhD in experimental psychology from the University of Cambridge. And had a, and completed a Wellcome Trust postdoctoral fellowship with economists and neuroscientists at the University of Zurich and University College London. Um, Dr. Crockett's work covers a wide range of topics about moral decisions and the morality of others, using theory and methods from a range of fields in psychology and neuroscience, economics, and data science. Uh, in her work, Dr. Crockett has received a, a ton of awards. Uh, the Janet Taylor Spence Award for Transformative Early Career Contributions from the Association for Psychological Science, uh, the SPSP uh, Sage Young Scholars Award, uh, also the Daniel Wagner Theoretical Innovation Prize, uh, grants from the John Templeton Foundation, National Science Foundation, NIH. And her work is published in many of the field's top journals, including Nature Human Behavior. Uh, trends in Cognitive Sciences, Nature Communications, Perspectives in Psychological Science, and more. Uh, her work on outrage has uh, been very influential, and it's uh, the topic of her work today. So please join me in welcoming Molly Crockett. Two years of Zoom and still can't figure out the mute button. <laughs> Can everyone see my slides all right? Uh, yes. Awesome. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm really excited for this conversation, and I'm, I'm especially excited about the format of this because I think this work really does um, raise a lot of interesting ethical questions, but I'm not a philosopher. So um, I always love chatting with uh, professionals on these questions. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation with Dr. Norlock later. Um, 
In October 2021, Facebook whistleblower Francis Haugen leaked thousands of internal documents to Congress and the press. One of the many things we learned from the Facebook papers, as they were called, is that Facebook's newsfeed algorithm prioritized angry reactions five times over and above other types of reactions, facilitating the spread of toxic, polarizing, and false content on the platform. These findings were uncovered by internal research at the company, hidden from the public, and ultimately exploited to prioritize company profits over public safety. Testifying before British Parliament, Haugen said, anger and hate is the easiest way to grow on Facebook. Reading these headlines was a pretty weird experience for me personally, because my lab had spent the past five years re researching similar questions about outrage and toxicity on social media with very little cooperation and help from the social media companies themselves. Today, I'm gonna to tell you about some of that research, how it started, what we found so far and where we're going. Um, and I'm really looking forward to, to hearing your feedback. Before I dive in, I wanna say a few words about our approach in this work. As you might've gathered already, this is a critical applied project. We're doing this work because we were concerned about the potential for social media platforms to cause harm. So we've been using pre-registration, open code and materials, open science methods um, to be as transparent as possible in this work. We also have uh, combined observational studies of large scale naturalistic data um, with experimental approaches. The reason being that they each have their strengths. So obviously we wanna study uh, social behavior in the wild on social media, um, but there are big limitations to this approach. In particular, uh, these methods are correlational, so we can't make causal inferences. And also the, the methods that we use to extract meaning from text online involve making certain assumptions um, that, that we might want to uh, test with a little bit more granularity uh, with experiments where we can make causal infer inferences and have more control. Um, so this is a research program that's really taking this multi-pronged approach towards our research questions. So we've been focusing on moral outrage and um, broadly we can consider moral outrage to be anger and disgust at the violation of some moral standard. There's evidence that moral outrage leads to a desire to shame and punish the target uh, and in an intergroup context uh, it can motivate collective action to achieve goals for the in-group. And expressing outrage can be effective in discouraging future transgressions. A lot of these factors influencing outrage are, are you know, they're, they're a way to think about um, outrage as kind of an intentional expression. Um, and these are all valid. But what I also wanna highlight is that outrage expressions can also be sensitive to factors that have less to do with individual moral convictions, uh, particularly in the context of social media. And so we've been considering uh, two of those factors. The first is reinforcement learning or the tendency to repeat behaviors that have been rewarded in the past. Online, uh, outrage is triggered by stimuli that call attention to a moral norm violation. Uh, people express outrage with a range of responses like sending messages or sharing the messages of others. Um, those outrage expressions um, then get reinforced. Uh, they get likes and shares on so social media. And those positive outcomes uh, then uh, uh, reinforce the outrage responses. So throughout this process, we can expect individual users' outrage expressions to increase over time. The second factor we've looked at is what we call norm learning. So people might match their expressions of outrage to what they infer is normative among their peers through observation. So you can imagine that networks might vary in their level of outrage expressions. And newcomers to any of these networks uh, would observe how much outrage is sort of common or rare. And then they might adjust their own expressions to conform to the group norm. So as outrage propagates through social networks, individuals learn via observation that outrage expression is appropriate for that network and then become more likely to express outrage in the future, regardless of whether they have been individually rewarded for their outrage or not. 
Now, crucially, um, past work suggests that reinforcement learning and normal learning processes might interact with one another. Specifically, uh, previous studies have shown that when individuals can directly observe which actions are most valuable, they rely less on reinforcement learning. So moral outrage expressions might be guided more by norm learning than reinforcement learning when outrage is normative in a social network. So to summarize our, hypo our, our theory uh, suggests the following hypotheses. First, that individual users will learn to express more outrage over time on social media. Second, that positive social feedback for outrage expressions will increase the likelihood of future outrage expressions through this reinforcement learning process. Third, that people will conform their outrage expressions to the expressive norms of their social networks through norm learning. And finally, norm learning will overshadow reinforcement learning when normative information is readily observable. Now to test these hypotheses, we needed to build a new tool for measuring moral outrage on social media. And this was only possible uh, with this amazing team, uh, Billy Brady, who's about to start a position at Northwestern, uh, Kellogg, uh, Killian McLaughlin, who's a PhD student in my lab, and um, Tuan Duan, who is now at um, Quora. Together, we built a uh, machine learning classifier that can automatically detect moral outrage expressions in social media text. The way we trained our classifier was with a data set of 26,000 tweets from a variety of episodes of viral public outrage, um, engaging a variety of ideologies. So we have tweets uh, containing outrage from mostly people um, on the, the left side of the political spectrum about Trump's transgender military ban, uh, outrage from mostly conservatives about actor Jesse Smollett's faked altercation with Trump supporters, outrage from both liberals and conservatives about the Kavanaugh Supreme Court hearings, and a viral video about some high school students who got into an altercation with a Native American man in Washington, D.C. Uh, and finally, my personal favorite, uh, an episode of non-political outrage where United Airlines um, dragged a passenger off an overbooked flight, Everyone on the political left and the right uh, turns out hates United Airlines, so we were able to get a lot of outrage tweets from that incident. We then use theory driven instructions to train expert human annotators to hand label all 26,000 of these tweets as to whether they contain outrage or not. With this labeled data, we then use supervised machine learning to build a deep neural net classifier that can automatically detect outrage expressions in social media text. We call it the digital outrage classifier and we can give it uh, new tweets and it will determine uh, some probability that each tweet is expressing outrage or not. So here are a couple of examples of tweets categorized by our classifier from the Kavanaugh Supreme Court hearings. Here's an example of an outrage tweet. And here's an example of a non outrage tweet. For any of you who are um, in the machine learning world, our uh, algorithm achieves classification accuracy on par with expert human annotators around 76% with an F1 score of 0.74. Um, we've made this software freely available to academic researchers. Um, it's on our lab's Git GitHub and um, you can find more information in our published paper online if you wanna use this in your own work. So to test our hypotheses about reinforcement learning and norm learning, we constructed data sets by identifying users whose tweets had appeared in our training sets. We specifically wanted to compare users with higher versus lower levels of political engagement to see if these questions are generalizable. So we identified high political engagement users from the Kavanaugh data set and less politically engaged users from the United data set. And all of the results that we find in this work uh, replicate in both data sets. So having identified the users, um, we then gather their history of tweets. Um, this ends up in about uh, 12 million tweets in total. Um, we then uh, gather the likes and the retweets that each tweet received. Those are the, the social reinforcements. Um, and we apply the outrage classifier to each tweet. And then what we do is um, we, we build time lag regression models to test the reinforcement learning hypothesis. Um, so what we find just to give an overall summary, cause I don't have much time, is that the rewards that you get for expressing outrage today 
positively predict tomorrow's outrage, especially when, when rewards are more than expected when you get a, a positive prediction error. So this is consistent with the idea that people are using social re rewards to learn to express more outrage over time. We also find evidence for the norm learning hypothesis. So individual users are more likely to express outrage in networks where outrage is already common. Um, and finally, we, we confirm this prediction that norm learning overshadows reinforcement learning in networks where outrage is more common. So when there's a lot of outrage around, people are less sensitive to that individual reward feedback and they're more just following the norms of the group. These effects also replicate in two pre-registered behavioral experiments in a simulated Twitter environment. And this work is published, so I'm not going to spend too much uh, any more time talking about this, but turn to some of our unpublished work. So after we had gathered a lot of evidence for this idea that the, the structure of social media, the way that we get rewards um, can, can amplify moral outrage expressions over time at the individual user level, we, we wanted to know, you know, so what? Like, why should we care? Um, and, and here are a few things that we've explored in recent work. So first, we've explored the role of outrage in spreading misinformation online. Second, we've tested a hypothesis that online outrage is systematically misperceived in ways that might exacerbate conflict. And this will be, I think, particularly relevant for um, Catherine's uh, commentary. And finally, we're looking at whether um, moral outrage can uh, essentially you know, function as a form of hate speech when it's targeted um, against more members of minority groups. So I'll start with the misinformation project. Um, and this is pretty simple, so I'll just zoom through it. Given that social media algorithms amplify outrage, if you wanted to spread misinformation online, you might easily achieve that goal by provoking outrage. So we've tested a few hypotheses about the relationship between outrage online and the spread of mis and disinformation. First, we predicted that misinformation would evoke more outrage than factually accurate news. Second, that outrage would facilitate the spread of misinformation. Third, that misinformation would um, evoke more outrage than other types of emotions relative to factually accurate news. And fourth, that outrage would be associated with impulsive misinformation sharing. So seeing a headline, feeling really upset about it and sharing it through your network without actually reading the information first. So we tested these hypotheses in some experiments as well as observational studies on Twitter and Facebook. In the Twitter study, we collected tweets containing links to known misinformation and factually accurate URLs posted by typical users uh, during the 2016 presidential election. We then looked at responses to those tweets, including direct replies to a tweet, as well as um, quote tweets, so uh, manual replies that tag the tweet author. We then used our digital outrage classifier to classify the responses and quote retweets as containing outrage or not. This data set included um, 90,000 uh, tweets and uh, 18,000 responses. For the Facebook study, we used a sample taken from a large data set of all links shared publicly at least 100 times on Facebook. Within this data set, we then searched for all links to the same domains that were shared in the Twitter study. This query resulted in about 3,000 posts um, containing links to factually accurate news domains and about 6,700 posts with misinformation websites. Now, unfortunately, um, the way we were able to access this Facebook data was with this highly regulated uh, user agreement, and we weren't able to actually upload our digital outrage classifier to that computing environment. So as a proxy that's imperfect, we looked at uh, Facebook's emotional reactions to the posts, um, and we predicted that we would see similar patterns for the angry reactions in the Facebook data set. As, um, as we would see for outrage responses in the Twitter data set. So caveat, the Facebook results are, are about anger rather than moral outrage as defined um, by our earlier project, but um, we're hoping to see similar results in these two data sets. Okay, 
So um, in the Twitter data, we um, tested whether responses to misinformation contain um, more outrage expression than responses to factually accurate URLs. And so um, this is what I'm showing here. And this hypothesis was confirmed. So retweets, replies, and all responses together are showing a higher uh, probability of outrage expressions um, for the misinformation compared to fact factually accurate URLs. And moreover, these moral outrage expressions are significantly associated with increased engagement with the, with the misinformation. So more outrage in the tweets, more likes and retweets, unsurprising. In our Facebook data, we were able to get a little bit more specific. So again, I'm going to show you um, the comparison of different emotional responses for misinformation links compared to uh, legitimate news links. And what you can see here um, is that particularly for anger, but also for um, haha responses, uh, misinformation is getting more of those reactions relative to legitimate news sources. And we also in the Facebook data set had this really unique um, access to uh, basically uh, an indicator variable of whether a user had shared a news article without actually clicking through the link and reading it first. So what we looked at was um, whether these different emotional responses are predictive of this impulsive news sharing without reading it first for misinformation and factually accurate, accurate news. And so what I'm showing here is that basically the highest predictive value is uh, mis misinformation articles that evoke anger. So um, angry responses to misinformation are particularly associated with um, sharing an article without reading it first. And this relationship, this comparison for misinformation versus factually accurate news is just much higher than um, any of these other emotional responses. All right, finally, in our experiments, um, participants were exposed um, either to misinformation headlines or factually accurate news headlines. And the headlines in turn were designed to provoke high outrage or low outrage. And then we asked participants to report their sharing intentions, which is an imperfect measure of, of sharing actual behavior, but um, other work uh, by Dave Rand, Gord Pennycook and colleagues um, has shown that um, sharing intentions do actually correlate with um, real sharing behavior on social media. So it's, it's a useful proxy, it's not perfect. So what we find is that the outrage provoking headlines in orange um, are uh, associated or, or cause um, higher intentions to share the article, um, and this is the case both for misinformation links or factually accurate news links. So we have this sort of body of evidence that um, misinformation evokes more outrage. Outrage in turn provokes sharing. Uh, also, it seems like sharing without reading it first. So um, the, 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 the data overall suggests this idea that, that outrage is kind of an engine for the spread of misinformation throughout social networks. Okay, next consequence that we've been looking at is this idea that outrage expression on uh, social media might be misperceived. So why should we care about accurate perception of other people's emotions? Well, functional democracies require that we all have a, a, a reasonably accurate sense of how other people um, feel about moral and political issues. Because social media decouples the expression of outrage from its experience, you might appear outraged to other people on social media without actually feeling that strongly yourself. So users of social media might falsely believe that other people are more outraged than they actually are. And this problem gets exacerbated at the network level because our news feeds are not representative of our entire social network, but our minds might make inferences as if they are representative. So imagine a hypothetical social network where a minority of individuals express outrage about some issue. 
because as we've shown, those posts will get a disproportionate amount of engagement and social media algorithms care about engagement, those outrage posts are more likely to show up in the newsfeed. So then an individual user scrolling through that newsfeed might infer that more people in the network are outraged than actually are. And as I said earlier, that those individuals are more outraged than they actually are. So to test this hypothesis, we ran a series of field studies on Twitter that had an author phase and an observer phase. In the author phase, we collected tweets in real time and classified their level of outrage expression using our digital outrage classifier. Then we sent direct messages to the authors of those tweets and asked them to rate how outraged and how happy were you when you sent this particular tweet. We then store all of the tweets and the associated emotion ratings in a database. Separately, in the observer phase, we show those same tweets to a separate group of observer participants. And we ask those observers to judge how outraged and how happy do you think the author of this tweet was when they sent it? So we can then compare the author's actual emotion ratings with the predicted ratings from the observers. And what we find is that observers consistently judge the authors to be more outraged than the authors themselves actually report feeling. This effect is specific to outrage. We don't see this pattern with happiness ratings. Um, we've replicated this effect across three field study deployments, each of which have about 200 message authors and 350 observers. So you can see here, um, the observers are reporting that they think the authors are more outraged than the authors actually say they are in reference to these tweets we're not seeing the same result for happiness. And strikingly, this over-perception effect is stronger in observers who report that they spend more time engaging with political content on social media. So in a parallel series of experiments, we examine the consequences of over-perceiving outrage. So our database contains tweets that vary in their levels of both reported outrage by the authors and perceived outrage by the observers. So we can take these tweets and the ratings and create two simulated news feeds where the level of ac actually, um, where, where the level of um, actual outrage reported by the authors is identical. So these little uh, thermometers are the same on the author side. Um, but in the over-perception feed, those, um, those tweets are consistently over-perceived. So observers are perceiving more outrage than the authors report feeling. But in the accurate perception feed, um, the observer and the author ratings are matched. So we then randomly assign participants to scroll through either the over-perception feed or the accurate perception feed. And we then measure the effect um, of being exposed to these different news feeds on a variety of dependent measures related to affective polarization and intergroup conflict. So what we find across these experiments is relative to the accurate perception condition, the overperception of outrage increases perceptions of collective outrage in the network overall increases beliefs about the norms of outrage expression in the network, exacerbates polarization so that the network is believed to have warmer feelings towards in-group members and colder feelings towards out-group members, um, with the effect size for out-groups being nearly twice as large as for in-groups, and increases beliefs about the network's ideological extremity. So in summary, this work suggests that users of social media are seeing more outrage um, than authors actually report feeling. And this has a lot of uh, consequences for sort of collective beliefs about outrage, polarization, ideology, and so on. Okay. 
I'm doing okay on time. So the last consequence of outrage amplification I'll discuss today is the possibility that it motivates hate speech and network harassment. So unfortunately, um, network harassment and online hate speech is on the rise. Um, there's been a 28% increase in race-based hate speech in the US and the UK between 2019 to 2021. 14% increase in gender-based hate speech over the same time period, a 1,662% increase in Sinophobia since the beginning of the pandemic. One out of four Black Americans have faced racial harassment online. 25% 20, of young women report being sexually harassed online. I could go on and on. These are just a, a few figures. Um, Platforms have so far been unable to deal with the problem of networked hate speech and harassment. Um, and there has been quite a lot of research on the effects of, of this on users. Um, increasingly, there's also been research into understanding what motivates perpetrators uh, of, of networked hate and harassment. Uh, the idea being that if you can understand the motivation, uh, you might be able to develop effective interventions. So um, one possibility that's been raised is this idea that perpetrators of network harassment and hate speech uh, often feel um, morally justified in their behaviors. Um, and so this is a phenomenon that we describe as moralized hate speech. And as we've shown earlier, um, because moral outrage is amplified online, the concern is that this may accelerate the spread of hate speech as a side effect. So in this project, we've been looking at a very, very, very basic descriptive question, which is, can we find overlap between moral outrage expressions and hate speech expressions? And to do this, um, we use a large corpus of tweets that um, other researchers have gathered and hand label for a variety of forms of hate speech. So um, specifically, we identified um, six data sets uh, from a resource called hatespeechdata.com. Um, and you can see here, they vary in size. Um, they're all from Twitter. Uh, they vary in terms of how hate speech is defined. Um, some of them are, are really broad. Some of them are focused on more specific groups. Um, they vary in terms of their uh, time period. They vary in terms of how, um, how the hate speech labels were annotated. Um, we actually see this diversity as a strength of this data set because um, the results that I'm going to show you are pretty consistent across these data sets, despite them being um, like really diverse in terms of like definition of hate speech, like where the data is coming from, and so on. Um, so we just have one punchline, really. This is an early stage project. Um, and that is how much do hate speech um, expressions and moral outrage expressions overlap? We basically take all of these um, tweets in the data set, we run them through our outrage classifier, and then we look at the co-occurrence of hate speech and moral outrage. Um, so here's a result. Um, you can see you know, three things here. First, there's, you know, there's more moral outrage expressions than hate speech expressions um, in the data set. Um, but where they do co-occur, there's a huge degree of overlap. Um, it's you know 70 something percent um, when you when you condition on hate speech. The vast ma majority of tweets that have been labeled as containing hate speech also are categorized as um, containing moral outrage expressions. So this is pre preliminary evidence that if you have social media algorithms that are you know, looking for engagement and moral outrage and, and amplifying those tweets um, on that basis, um, you might be inadvertently um, contributing to the spread of network hate speech, hate speech and harassment. And unfortunately, despite the published policies of social media platforms, quite a lot of, um, of hateful content uh, remains on the site and is not taken down even if it's flagged. Okay, so um, I will wrap up. Um, we have identified a number of consequences of outrage amplification online. Um, outrage is an engine for the spread of disinformation and may cause people to share information without reading it first. Outrage expressions are overperceived online, inflating beliefs about polarization and intergroup hostility. We see substantial overlap 
between outrage and hate speech. Um, and this means that engagement-based algorithms might facilitate the spread of hate speech online. And so the sort of overall conclusion, um, which you know, has actually an applied angle to it is that outrage might be a general affective marker for harmful online content, um, which you know, does, I think, open some, some windows towards understanding um, how to intervene um, or at the very least uh, identify that content more quickly. So just to sum up overall, some of the conclusions of this work that we've been doing um, for the past several years, um, technology companies have traditionally liked to argue that their products are just providing neutral platforms for social behaviors. You know, we bring people together, but we don't actually change those behaviors. And um, our data and, and many others in the field, I think, uh, are, are just really not consistent with this claim. If moral outrage is a fire, social media is like gasoline, and this has concerning consequences for the shared reality that is essential for a functioning democracy. Now, our work has sometimes been misread in the past as suggesting that there's something inherently bad about outrage and that amplification of digital outrage is a problem because we should all just tone things down and get along with other, one another. And I wanna be very clear that this is not our view. I do think there is a lot to be legitimately outraged about and outraged channeled into activism, whether that's online or offline, has a lot of potential um, for you know, progressive social change. Um, at the same time, I do think our work raises several um, concerning questions about the algorithmic amplification of outrage. For example, you know, should tech companies have so much control uh, over these expressions of our moral emotions that are so central to you know, how we see ourselves, our views of the world? Are we okay with the fact that platform designers um, have the ability to influence outrage expressions and how far they reach, which could in turn influence the success or failure of social and political movements? These are just a few questions on my mind. I'm really looking forward to hearing more from Catherine. Um, for now, I will just um, thank my very talented um, team and our funders and thanks to all of you for um, your attention. And I'm looking forward to hearing questions. Great, thank you, Molly. Really interesting presentation. And anybody who has questions, please uh, drop them into the chat. Um, we'll try to take them in order received and take a, at least a few minutes just for questions for this particular talk. Um, Cameron Richardson writes, uh, thank you for this work. Have you conducted any studies on interventions meant to dampen the spread of misinformation and or outrage, e.g. intervention users replying to misinformed tweets or outrage tweets with different content, such as attempts to moderate emotion, we're, like, we're all in this together, attempts to inform about the inaccuracy, e.g. that's not how I read this article, what do you think about this alternative perspective? or to ask the poster to be more mindful about how they're feeling when posting, e.g. is everything okay? Or to suggest that they may be controlled by the media. So like, yeah, you know. great question. Um, so we are, we are doing one study at the moment um, where we're doing a very, very simple educational intervention, um, just teaching people how social media algorithms work and trying to um, convey the idea that I, that I shared in, in the misperception part of my talk that like, what you see in your feed is just not representative of how everyone in your social network feels. And we're then gonna test that on um, whether, whether that information um, changes the effects of, of the misperception um, exposure uh, on these beliefs about collective outrage and, and intergroup conflict. Um, some of the other interventions that you've suggested actually have been beta tested by Twitter. So. Um, so Twitter will now, I don't know if they're doing this for everyone or if, it's, or if they're still testing it internally. If you try to retweet uh, an article that links, or a, if you retweet a tweet that links to a URL, an article, but you haven't clicked on the URL, it will ask you in a little pop-up, do you wanna read this article before retweeting? Um, don't know what the results of that research are. Incidentally, so I got invited to be on a, a panel uh, an advisory board for Twitter um, with the team who designs these interventions. And I was really excited about it. And it ended up getting deadlocked in the um, 
in the contracts and non-disclosures agreements. And they wanted me to sign their sort of standard consulting agreement, which basically said that anything I do in my lab ever for perpetuity that was related to what was discussed during these meetings would be owned by Twitter. And I was like, no. Um, and it just like reached the impasse. And, and, you know, one lesson there is that there just isn't infrastructure set up for, you know, reasonable interfacing between, um, big tech companies and academics who do research uh, on the tech companies. And, you know, everyone who was involved in those interactions was like really well-meaning, um, but there just like wasn't institutional infrastructure for that to, to, to go through. Um, your question about empathy, um, there's a really cool paper um, coming out of, uh, recently out of Jamil Zaki's lab um, by uh, Louisa, oh, what's her last name? Santos, I think, um, about uh, sort of, empathy interventions and how that, you know, changes the way that liberals and conservatives see each other online. That's like super cool and, and relevant. I'll see if I can find it and post it in the chat. Um, so those are some things that we've been working on and others are working on. Great. Um, one of my colleagues here, Sean Laurent has a question. Uh, really interesting and scary talk, he says. Uh, to what extent do you think the, an the anonymity of these platforms encourages this kind of behavior? And for non-anonymous posters, do they implicitly or explicitly understand how outrage will promote their posts and then use that for their own purposes? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, the question of anonymity has been one that's 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 um, been really, you know, active uh, for a long time in, in social social media research. And I, I think that as as time has progressed, the um, like the the answer to that question has become more and more nuanced. So I mean, initially it was sort of thought like, oh no, like the internet is anonymous and you know cyberbullying is gonna be such a problem. And like, yes, there is definitely evidence to support that. And there's also evidence that in certain contexts being um, named is actually, you know, predictive of, um, you know, aggressive or bullying behaviors, um, particularly in, in moralized contexts, because we know that expressing moral outrage and, and punishing transgressions, when those transgressions are seen by members of your network as bad, like you gain reputation points by expressing outrage about that thing and by targeting uh, the, the transgressor. So, I mean, it's kind of a two-edged sword, like in, in, in some cases, anonymity uh, can turn up the heat, but in other cases, like being named actually is, is predictive. So it's, it's complicated. Great. And we have time for a couple more questions, um, but while waiting for maybe another one to roll in. Now, I thought one thing that could be useful, um, you know, in thinking of the outrage classifier, it's great that it's accessible I was just curious if in terms of in terms of like how it works for those who are less familiar with like machine learning or just some of the features of outrage that it's picking up on, like to what what sorts of like assumptions about like the nature of emotion or outrage versus other emotions are sort of built into it that shapes like what's detected in people's posts. Yeah, great question. So one kind of dirty secret of machine learning is that the most accurate models are black box models. So we use a deep neural net, which, you know, it's it's not easily interpretable without doing a lot of additional research, which we would be excited to do, but haven't done yet. Um, it, it, it requires sort of, um, you know, interrogating what information is being represented in the different layers of the network and, um, and so we we don't know. <laughs> what we do know is that it um, it it does as good a job as humans do. And the seventy six percent agreement is you know the ceiling of of what we get with with you know humans who are trained to recognize outrage and the the instructions that we gave them, which I think are relevant, are like you know outrage is this sort of mixture of anger, contempt, disgust that is like triggered by a particular you know action that's seen as violating a moral norm, not necessarily something that you think you, the, the annotator think is moral, but like what the, the person who expressed it thinks is, is immoral. Um, it should have some indication of wanting to like shame or punish the target, 
Um, we distinguish outrage expressions from like trolling or sort of like, you know, sarcasm. And um, yeah, uh, those, are, those are the main, those are the main criteria. They go through a training. We had um, both sort of crowdsourced, um, you know, online, online research participants do these labels. And also we recruited um, social psychology grad students. Um, so people who have more expertise in the psychology of, of emotions um, doing these ratings. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I assume that the, the algorithm is using um, cues that are related to our instructions, um, but it's, it's not clear exactly, exactly what. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, and one thing that was interesting, I just also with the, there's a couple of questions that are rolled in on the Q&A. q and I'm seeing, yeah. To, that I'll, I'll, then we can probably move on. But you know, one thing is interesting, which is with you mentioned on Facebook specifically, and I say this because the first question is about different platforms. You know, you have the, the, the anger emoticon, but also the laugh emoticon, which seems to have this interesting dual function in online, especially on Facebook, just in terms mm -hmm. of delegitimization de of different perspectives. Right. So totally. And, and I mean, it, it's, it's striking that the, the one emotion response that sort of goes together with anger in our Facebook data set is haha, right? Like they're like they're those wouldn't necessarily be two emotions that you would expect to go together, you know, from the perspective of like emotion research, but like when you take it to the context of social media, it does seem more intuitive, doesn't it? Well, then let's let's take these two last questions and then move on to Dr. Norlock's talk. Um, yeah. uh, Emily asks, what's known about the tone of social media changing across platforms? Uh, just on, in a non-research-based observation, places like LinkedIn seem to have become more of a space for moral outrage than has historically been true. How does something like this happen? How do the norms of a platform end up changing? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I think um, I think the like my speculation is that the the platforms have a a decent amount of control over the norms because they're controlling what gets prioritized in the news news feed. So in one of the one of the things to come out of the Facebook papers was the revelation that um, that at one point Facebook was um, prioritizing anger at five times the rate of other responses in the um, in the in in what goes into the news feed. And this wasn't like some engineer at Facebook was like, we should really prioritize anger. It was just like the, the algorithm was learning you know, the algorithm was optimizing for what's going to what's going to generate the most profit for Facebook, what's going to keep people on Facebook the longest. And it turned out that in, like like content that provokes anger is um, is going to keep people online the longest. And so then that is what ends up getting uh, increase in priority in the algorithm. So like these are side effects. Right. But they're they're really pernicious. And then I guess um, Facebook discovered this and and at one point turned that feature off. So I think that that's actually not currently how um, anger is, I think they might've turned it down to zero actually um, at one point, certainly before the election. But like, so, you know, the norms of the platform can change by changing the algorithms that reinforce individual users' behavior and, and the algorithms that decide which content to show in the platform. Because as our research has, has shown for the case of moral outrage, like people learn this stuff, like our brains are set up to learn like what is normative and like what are other people saying? And I'm gonna say that too. So you get these like spiraling effects. Great, and one last quick question from Lourdes. She asks, is there any additional research on cancel culture and how much of online moralized hate speech and moral outrage may be correlated with online canceled individuals? Yeah, so um, it's been so interesting to, to watch the, the evolution of the, the term cancel culture um, over the past several years. And, um, you know, it's, it's actually a term that, that was, um, appropriated from um, Black American uh, vernacular and has now been really co-opted by the right to you know, refer to a lot of different phenomena, I think, um, in ways that make it harder to have productive conversations about how we want to 
build our online spaces. So, I mean, it's kind of in, like, I have found it amusing that a lot of the people who are really concerned about cancel culture and who are, you know, upset about having been canceled, like the very fact that they are able to complain about being canceled is kind of evidence that they haven't. So um, I, I, I think that, uh, I would like to retire the term cancel culture because I think it it generates a lot of, of confusion because different people use it to mean different things. Um, and, you know, I, I like to try to be uh, uh, precise in, in, in thinking about that. And also, also just, you know, over the course of doing this research, I have become a lot more sensitive to how power structures really control the narratives around how we talk about technology and think about its effects on us as individuals. And cancel culture is a really, really interesting case study on, on how like the meaning of that term is really controlled by, by people who have a lot of power, which then creates this kind of like interesting um, paradox. Well, there's definitely a lot of food for thought. And I think I, there's one more question. Let's, let's put a hold on that question until we come back to the, the chat, all, all, all of us. Um, so Aslan, if you wanna hold on to that question and come back to you. Um, so let's switch gears uh, to Dr. Norlock's talk. Um, let me first introduce her and then we'll go into uh, the, the talk. So Catherine Norlock is professor of philosophy in the Kenneth Mark Drain Chair in Ethics at Trent University in Petersburg, Ontario, and affiliate faculty in Gender and Women's Studies. Uh, she's the co-founder and co-editor of Feminist Philosophy Quarterly, a peer-reviewed open access journal free to authors and readers. Uh, some of the projects that she focuses on include moral emotions and ethical virtues, particularly uh, forgiveness. Uh, she notes that everything that she writes comes back to the, the idea of relational self and how we relate to others. Um, and in particular, in relation to applied ethics, uh, she has a, a book including Forgiveness from a Feminist Perspective. Um, she's published in journals, including the Journal of Moral Philosophy, um, the Journal of Social Philosophy, Hypatia, Journal of Value of Inquiry. Um, she has a chapter in the forthcoming Oxford Handbook of Moral Psychology on Forgiveness and Moral Repair look forward to reading. Um, her, she has received many awards, including the Merit Award for Excellence in Research from Trent University uh, and, and NEH Summer Institute, the 2018 P. Soup Award for Best Discussion Originator, um, and an Aid to Journals grant from the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada. I can say that I, I've read her work recently. We actually read uh, one of your papers for our lab meeting. It was quite interesting and provoked a lot of interesting discussion from a group of psychologists and so I'm really curious to see, uh, to, to continue the conversation here. So uh, welcome, Dr. Norlock. Thank you, thank you for having me. And uh, I wanna thank Molly for the enjoyable presentation that was so much fun to listen to. Uh, I'm dying to ask Daryl which paper he's talking about, but first, why don't I talk about what I've got for you? Uh, apologies for my voice, I just got a bit of a cold. And I'm dropping into chat just the link to the work cited for this because I want to mention a bunch of philosophers and every now and then someone says, <laughs> Who did you mention? So that link is just the work cited so that people know which ones I'm talking about. I will go to share screen and attempt to share my screen with you. Can everyone see my screen? And am I audible and visible to you? Yep. I am. Okay, great. So uh, the talk is, whoops, the talk is, do you feel like I do? Because I do want to emphasize uh, quite a bit the extent to which I am going to agree with Molly that I don't think the I don't think the issues we're talking about or the answers to them are going to be individualistic. I think a lot of what we do is relational and all my work comes back to that anyway, so it's probably not a surprise. I'm gonna shrink my, my Zoom interfaces since they are junking up my screen quite a bit. There. And first I gotta prepare you for disappointment. So that the organizer's website says the goal of having two speakers to see, is to see how two fields, philosophy and psychology view topics differently. And Molly Crockett and I will not differ much like, at all on our, our concerns and our solutions. I mean, such as they are, uh, not that there are solutions. But uh, yeah, I noticed, I wrote down when Molly said, um, should these corporations have so much control over our emotions? And I can imagine at least one person that's listening thinking, well, we should control ourselves. And a lot of my talk is going to be, that is not 
to be expected in the kind of thing we're talking about. Like self-control is not going to save us from our problems. So uh, my recent work on online shaming is concerned with extents to which we are in some ways very willing participants. And to that extent, you could say that's up to us. Uh, but we're willing participants on social media platforms that are in addition designed to overrun us, right? Not against our wills, but in concert with our wills and uh, in some exploitation of our wills. And so that's gonna be the focus of my short talk in the first half. And my outline, welcome to text heavy philosopher slides. We're not about the beautiful pictures, we're all about the text. Uh, but my outline is that in the first part, I'd like to talk about the main purpose of online outrage. Um, which I suggest is relational bonding with imagined audiences and imaginal relationships. Um, I'll be explaining what imaginal relationships are, but to an extent, I wanna um, suggest that we can't help cultivating these things. In the second part, I wanna talk about some of the moral risks. Following philosopher Laurie Paul, I wanna say that we risk these personal and epistemic transformations in our core concepts of the world when we engage in these sorts of um, outrage communities. And I've engaged in them myself. So what'll be clear as I go through this talk is that I don't think uh, online outrage is something those bad people over there do. I think it's something a lot of us take part in. What I don't do in this talk, so just gonna say this really briefly, is uh, attend to um, different types of outrage and different types of outrage communities. I think there's a difference between uh, third party political outrage at something that involves other people and a more personal set of outrage communities when you feel like you're attacked or someone you love is attacked. So that'll involve different um, solutions too. A possible of these moral risks, a possible transformation that worries me is distortions in our understanding of collective emotion, which Molly Crockett was saying can include a really over perceiving outrage in your community. And my concern is that that can be both the product of and or the impetus to enter an echo chamber, and I'll be talking about T1's work on echo chambers. Then the third part, given depending on how much time I have, I wanna talk about outrage as thinking fast as system one reasoning. <laughs> and uh, I wanna conclude that anger and hope are related and that empathy could help here. And that's kind of good news. Uh, is this gonna sound like a happy conclusion? Sure, why not? Uh, I think we need a, a little happiness and uh, like, Molly Crockett, I'm not going to be suggesting that there's a lot of interventions that work all the time. Most of my news is bad, uh, but T. Wen suggests something that Megan, Megan Phelps Roper affirms in her memoir, Unfollow. If you haven't uh, read the snippets of it that were in publication this past year, it's a memoir of loving and leaving the Westboro Baptist Church. She was in one of those echo chambers. She did out online outrage as part of her work as the Twitter spokesperson. <laughs> But uh, she could attest that empathy and emotional engagement can disrupt even an echo chamber, and that's good news. I am italicizing the word can because, of course, it is what T1 would call only the thinnest whisper of a hope. It doesn't always work. But that's kind of a happy conclusion. All right. I want to do my unhappy start, though, and um, acknowledge that we are and can be and have been hacked and hijacked. So I want to talk a lot about what we do and what uh, online outrage people do, but I don't want to underestimate the extent to which um, we are exploited, you know, that social media platforms do work in concert with our wills. Uh, Dr. Luskin here brought out the hacking of the American mind five years ago. I'm sure you're all familiar with that today. And uh, journalist Paul Lewis uh, brought out our minds can be hijacked and, and he interviewed um, a lot of Google, Twitter, and Facebook engineers. Those of you who are excited at the social dilemma documentary last year would have found a lot of this in uh, Paul Lewis's work too. So I don't want to underestimate that. Um, my work on online emotion is focused on the varieties of ways in which as smartphone owners and social media participants, we're not controlled thinkers. We're not usually very rational. And um, in other work, I go so far as to say that we don't even really consent to uh, the ways in which we are manipulated on social media platforms. Like in theory, you consent to entering into social media, but uh, you don't remain a consenting individual. I can talk about that more in Q&A. So having said we're hacked and hijacked while we're online, I also wanna emphasize that we also have good reasons to pursue online imaginal relationships. We really do. And by imaginal relationships, I'm going to be referring to relationships that we endow with imaginative development 
of their import meaning and membership. I talked about this a little in my 2017 paper. I'm not the person who came up with that phrase. So I wanted to credit my predecessors that uh, it's Mary Watkins who came up with the word imaginal. And um, she intends it in contrast to imagined or imaginary. Mary Watkins cites George Herbert Mead's view that imaginal dialogues are constitutive of reason. So when we talk about imaginal dialogues and imaginal relationships, we're not talking about something that's unreasonable to do, right? That it, there's a way in which it's, it's not reasonable to engage in imagined dialogue when you're trying to write something or prepare something, prepare this lecture. And I think uh, Molly Crock and I would agree that there's an extent to which, you know, none of the things she's describing when she describes over perception of outrage are descriptions of just imagining pure fiction, right? It's all the perceptions we have and then what we do with them in this imaginal way. Mary Gergen is where I first came across imaginal relationships. So she's going to cite Watkins and Mead. Uh, she uses it because she is a psychologist in continuing bond theory. She says we have imaginal relationships even with deceased loved ones. I can talk to you more about why I think you still have relationships with your dead <laughs> later. Um, and similarly, if, if you're not familiar with any of these, you might be familiar with Benedict Anderson, who in 1983 wrote Imagined Communities. And I wanna um, show you this excerpt from Imagined Communities by Benedict Anderson, because I wanna emphasize that this is something that's just true of us as humans and it predates the internet, right? So um, yes, I did put a Donald Trump uh, tweet in the corner of this slide. As I uh, tell you, Benedict Anderson says, a nation is an imagined political community. Imagined because the members of even the smallest nation will never know most of their fellow members or meet them or even hear of them. Yet in the minds of each lives the image of their communion. Any community larger than a small village is, he says, and should be distinguished not by their falsity or genuineness, but by the style in which they're imagined. And I would add that online communities are often larger than a small village. <laughs> if you read that tweet, it can be a vast silent majority. It's very big, <laughs> it's a majority. And you might be thinking, but it's not true, it's not true. And I, I think Benedict Anderson is right that what matters is not the truth or falsity. What matters is, is the sorts of uh, perceptions we engage in and how we build them up and develop them in our minds. So that's gonna matter for ethics too. I can explain more in chat because I'm skipping a lot to get this into time. And I want to add that we have both reflective and unreflective imaginal relationships. So we can have imaginal relationships that we do not cultivate in our minds voluntarily. And they're kind of imposed on you, right? So I would suggest our parents, uh, senders of texts or emails that we get and potential others in the mirror when we dress to go out are all um, individuals and groups and imaginal relationships with us that are sort of imposed upon us. And then we um, attach meaning to them and build up and out our attitudes toward them. And we can also have imaginal relationships that we cultivate deliberately. And my examples here are pitch meetings, planned children, potential future students. I really cultivate uh, my imaginal relationships with my potential future students when I'm designing syllabi and assignments. And importantly, some imaginal relationships are mixed. They're both voluntarily and involuntarily built up in our heads. And here I would include like our loved ones, my fellow Americans, although I'm in Canada now, I am also an American citizen, uh, our coworkers. These are built up in our heads in ways that are sort of imposed on us and sort of cultivated by us, right? Well, I wanna suggest that those online interactions we have are the mixed variety of imaginal relationships. And I like quoting media researcher Eden Litt here when she says, the less an actual audience is visible or known, the more individuals become dependent on their imagination. And of course, the reason I'm describing these as mixed in our online outreach communities is because there really is an extent to which the actual audience is both known to you and not known to you, right? Uh, they, they are communities that you probably enter to an extent voluntarily. And in addition, they're indefinite. Like you have no idea how many people are actually out there when you guys are trading these comments. And I do trade them. So I consider myself part of the uh, participants in online outrage. <laughs> so uh, I don't think I'm describing somebody I'm not. So uh, I, I put here just for my own uh, sake, the quaintness of the concern in early social network literature, 
uh, that there would be a shallowness of transient relationships. That this was this was early literature in the '90s and the aughts. The the worry that uh, relationships online would be so shallow and transient. And uh, now that sounds so nice. <laughs> now they just live in my head. But so my motivating concern regarding online outrage is the relationships produced when we cannot help thinking about and caring about emotional sharing online. So we have a tendency to not just engage with it while we're online, but to have it stick in our heads afterward. This is partly due to negativity bias, which we don't have a lot of time to talk about here, but can talk about in the Q&A. All right, so if I'm going too fast, uh, just mop this up and get back to me. And I'll move on to the second part and talk about uh, the moral risks I was worried about with respect to these imaginal relationships that we take part in when we're doing online outrage. And I worry about two in particular. I mentioned negativity bias, and that's the selective attention of the brain to negative information, right? Because online outrage is sticky. Uh, I noticed in the Q&A, the question we couldn't quite get to at the end of Molly's talk was um, a question about why people like outrage. And that's, there's actually, there's a lot of literature on that already, that um, pre-internet, there were already people um, verifying empirically that we do seem to enjoy outrage to an extent. Uh, it does make you feel righteous. It's related to um, aspects of contempt. It's related to feeling up here while other people are down there below you. It has sort of lowness criterion, which I can talk about. But uh, despite the fact that outrage feels kind of good uh, insofar as it shares in these other more righteous <laughs> attitudes, it does um, get conveyed and expressed online using uh, negative language. And negative language is something we are attuned to pay attention to, right? Um, my fellow instructors in the audience will know that if you read 100 course evaluations and 99% of them are positive and one is negative, <laughs> What you'll remember at dinner that night is a negative one. Uh, so we have this sort of selective attention to negative information. And I worry about that. That's a moral risk of taking part in online outrage, the way it stays with you. And relatedly, I, uh, I think it's a moral risk we take um, that we engage in these epistemic transformative experiences. And here I'm using Lori Paul's language. So philosopher Lori Paul is at Yale. Uh, she describes uh, transformative experiences in this book, and she describes them as both epistemic uh, and in some ways, uh, personal transformative experiences. They're two related and different types. What she says on transformative experiences, sorry about the extent to which you can't see all the text because the bars, is that uh, those of us who've not yet had the experiences cannot fully appreciate what is rational for the transformed agent, given uh, changes to desires and deliberations that are results of the experience one can only know post-transformation. She says of epistemic transformative experiences, you cannot know what it will be like to have the experience before you have it yourself. And this poses a problem for a rational choice. So um, note that she's talking about making decisions in advance about what you would like to make a rational decision to do. And what I was telling you earlier is my concern that entering an online outrage isn't entirely um, rational choice in advance. It's really a mixed imaginal relationship. It's only partially chosen because it is to an extent also imposed upon you, especially when you are, have a selective uh, negativity bias, right? That um, you are drawn to those negative words. So it's not entirely chosen. So I'm really extending Paul's work here in a way she never intended. I'm, I wanna say that what she's describing is the epistemic transforming experiences of those who are trying to make choices about things that will change their very preferences based on what they come to know by having the experience. Um, that we have something like epistemic transformative experiences when we enter online outrage communities, we can't know in advance how they're going to change the way that we believe we perceive the world, the way that we think about what's true and false. And Molly Prockett, for in your, what you just heard, says the epistemic effects include distorted views of collective emotions as a result of sharing in that online outrage. So I hope you can see what is the worry I have about transformative experience. And that's just epistemic transformative experience, right? So uh, Paul also mentions personally transformative experiences. And what she says about these is they relate to experiences that affect changes in who one takes oneself to be post-transformation. And again, her point is that one cannot know in advance of the experience how it will fundamentally change one's point of view, 
or in the case of online outrage, how it can. Like the reason I'm describing these as a moral risk is because uh, for reasons that I don't think all of us fully understand yet, uh, some are more likely to be transformed than others, which makes it a horrifying moral risk. Uh, so one can't know in advance of the experience how it will fundamentally change one's point of view or the value-laden preferences that previously constituted one's view of one's own character. Uh, note my example earlier on of the Donald Trump tweet about the vast silent majority, right? That um, you might not have thought of yourself as a member of that before you saw the tweet, and yet you might take yourself to be this person after engaging in some online outrage regarding it. So um, it really could be a risk of a personally transformative experience that you don't consent to in advance. Like nobody fires up their computer in the morning thinking, I want to um, be altered in ways uh, that will change who I take myself to be, right? So my even greater worry is that one form of personally transformative experience that um, concerns a lot of philosophers right now includes echo chambers. They come to constitute who one takes oneself to be. And I can explain uh, what we mean by echo chambers by quoting uh, philosopher T. Went. So for transformation uh, regarding uh, especially the um, distorted sense of your outrage community and like how many people are as outraged as you think they are, I'd like to refer you to T. Wen's article, Escape the Echo Chamber. And uh, the link to that, it's, it's a free online article um, on, in Aeon that uh, everybody should read. And the link to that is in the work cited that I gave you in the chat. So Wen's gonna describe an epistemic bubble, which is a, a larger thing, as when you don't hear people from the other side. And a lot of us are in epistemic bubbles, right? So that's just an informational network from which relevant voices have been excluded by omission. And an epistemic bubble can just be the result of omissions, doesn't have to be uh, willful, and doesn't have to be hostile anyway, it could just be an accident regarding who you talk to. When it goes on to describe an echo chamber as a social structure from which other voices, other relevant voices have been actively discredited. And it can be one, he says, that's as difficult to escape as a cult, because in the echo chamber, it's not that you just don't hear people from the other side, it's that you don't trust people from the other side. And as I said in more recent work, we're not as free to leave as we are to enter such circles, especially when they involve online outrage. Oh, that's in parentheses, that's the title I gave that recent paper. It was free and always will be. I like, I cheekily wanted to use Facebook's motto. <laughs> not in the way they intended. The, you won't be surprised that the answer to my title question is, <laughs> no, we will not always be. We're not as free to leave as we are to enter. Oh, so I left myself tons of time. I went through part one and part two faster than I intended. Apologies. So anything I went through too quickly, just ask me to follow up. But um, in part three, I want to get to um, more of the psychology and philosophy of a question I get every time I do this presentation on online emotion. Um, I've talked about online outrage, uh, online shaming, and online complaining quite a bit in other contexts. And uh, I'm actually pro-complaining. <laughs> I end up being rather anti-shaming, although not, I'm not entirely anti-shaming or outrage. There are times when I'm going to argue shaming and outrage could be in certain contexts appropriate, which is funny because Molly ended Q&A saying something roughly similar. And uh, I'm actually pro-complaining for, for a number of reasons. I think a lot of us did that during the pandemic. And because it's uh, sometimes appropriate and sometimes inappropriate, I do want to push back against this question I often get when I do presentations about online speech. Uh, somebody always asks me, why don't people just think before they tweet? And in response, I usually urge people to consider dual process theories of moral psychology. And not everybody even agrees with these. You don't have to agree with these to entertain the possibility that something like this is what's going on. So uh, not everybody's going to agree with dual process theories. But uh, psychologist Daniel Kahneman, philosopher Lisa Tessman, they uh, do some really instructive work uh, suggesting that we're not primarily governed by our slower, more deliberative of what you might call system two reasoning. So uh, Kahneman and Tessman will both describe system one reasoning as unconscious, associative, it's automatic rather than controlled, and it's fast. You don't have a lot of sense of voluntary control. And they're going to describe that as what we do the vast majority of the time as opposed to system two, which allocates attention to the effortful mental activities that demand it. It's 
conscious, it's inferential, it's controlled, and it's relatively slow and takes effort to put system two to work. So when you're um, writing something out, when you're planning something, you'll do more system two reasoning. And what I want to emphasize is that this is not what primarily governs our moment to moment interactions, right? So I give presentations like this, and it is understandable why people say afterwards, well, you just need to use system two and not system one. And I want to suggest, uh, even if it's not dual process that explains us, that um, telling us not to use our more automatic associative habits of mind, it's probably not going to be a successful recommendation. Philosophers in the room who may not have read um, System 1 and System 2 thinking before, but have read Tamar Gendler on A Leaf and B Leaf, are going to say, oh, this sounds like that. So, for my philosophers, I wanted to say this is related to what Gendler says on A Leaf and Belief. So, System 1 affective intuitive processes can include what Gendler calls A Leafs. And she means these uh, to be sort of in contrast to B Leafs. Um, so, this is the way uh, Gendler writes it in her famous article on this. So, she says, A Leafs are associative, automatic, irrational. They're shared with non-human animals, they're antecedent to other cognitive attitudes, and they're typically affect-laden and affect-generating. And the Aleph process is that you, you see a representation of something, you have an affective association, and it impels a certain behavior. So her famous example, which my students get a kick out of every time, is uh, this is feces-shaped fudge, that's the representation. Oh, look, feces-shaped fudge. Your affective association is this is gross and your behavior is you refuse the fudge. Even if someone assures you it's mostly butter and sugar, you say no. <laughs> and even if you see someone make it, uh, these uh, aliefs persevere, right? The sort of sticky recalcitrant aleaf perseveres even when we know they're false. And so uh, system one should sound a little like aliefs, which I think are a subset of system one. The system two controlled reasoning processes can include beliefs, uh, including justified true beliefs with propositional content. So when you tell yourself, I believe that I am someone who does not engage in online outrage ever, right? That's a propositional belief that you hold in your head and may believe about yourself. I find myself thinking it myself. All right. Well, uh, Gendler's conclusion in that famous paper is, you know, one hope for what we ought to do is to just get those aliefs in line, right? One view is that we ought to just bring our aliefs in line with good B-leafs so that the A-leafs are good ones. So um, that we, the things we do automatically and um, spontaneously and off the cuff will just be more in line with our propositional beliefs. They're, they're slower, more uh, committed thoughts that I am someone who ought not to make the online world worse. And I gently disagree with that. I think uh, sometimes S1 and S2 conflict for non-fungible reasons. So among my reasons for taking part in online communities and, um, and trying to take part in them better include a lot of S2 like commitments, right? Propositional commitments I have in my head that I'm committed to wasting less time online. I'm committed to civility, but I'm also committed to allyship. I'm committed to being strategic and moving others to action, to my well-being, to my political awareness. And I'm committed to all of these simultaneously. So these are all, you know, reason, propositional, slow, deliberate thoughts I have. And I would say that my sort of S1 reasons, um, my uh, spontaneous sort of associative feelings are that when I witness a friend's getting attacked online, these set off uh, alarm bells that uh, Tessman refers to. Lisa Tessman does wonderful work in a book called Moral Failure, which I also recommend highly. And what Lisa Tessman will describe as alarm bells is uh, the basic emotions, including anger, that serve as pre-descriptive dispositions in advance. So you have prescriptive dispositions in advance, such as the sense that a gross injury or an injustice ought not to be, right? Tessman likens such automatic intuitive reasoning processes to um, care ethicist Nell Nottingham's notion of the natural impulse to care, the I must. Hope you're following that. So we have this sort of I must impulse when we care. And the uh, automatic intuitive reasoning process that includes anger is sort of prescriptive disposition in advance to, you know, move when we perceive gross injury in this automatic associative intuitive way. 
there's a relationship of the sort of preponderant tendency of moral judgments to the moral motivations that uh, Jesse Prince and Sean Nichols describe. You sometimes act because you care rather than because it's what morality requires, right? So think of um, your beliefs about what morality requires as your, your system two processes or your slow deliberative reasoning. So you might think, you know, what morality requires is that I not, I not engage in too much online outrage, that not make the world a worse place, <laughs> that I be good, but also that I defend my friends, that I tell someone when I think they're doing something wrong, that I uh, really rise to defense of the defenseless, right? And uh, I hope you can see how those might conflict and result in different activities. But in other words, you know, you sometimes act because you care rather than because it's what morality requires. What morality requires is the slow, deliberate stuff. The because you care stuff is that spontaneous, intuitive, associative stuff. I witness a friend's getting attacked online. My alarm bells go off. <laughs> this angers me. This cannot be. So uh, this is the reason that people express outrage online. And it may not be irrelevant to system two morality, so much as a compelling form of moral response that just doesn't depend on our controlled justifications. Instead, it bears out basic values, including love or regard for those injured by someone you wish to respond to. Uh, you know, that feeling this to, that you want to say, tell someone you are wrong. Occasions for outrage provide excellent examples of systemic conflicts. That doesn't surprise you now. A righteous response to injury can be intuitive, automatic, and usually negative. It's a corollary of nodding's I must, that in the case of victims of wrongdoing can take the form of no, they must not, right? And I'm probably not the only one who's felt that. All right, I got plenty of time so I can talk about the last uh, two slides I have for you. If I can scroll. There. Well, my pitch is that, uh, whether, whether you embrace dual process reasoning or not, I wanna say that our, our impulsive automatic processes of um, thinking about what morality requires of us and our slower, more deliberative processes have qualitatively different value scales, right? And I wanna call your attention to the extent to which uh, emotions are moral remainders. And um, when I say they're moral remainders, I mean, we have these, moral conflicts, right? What Tess will describe as the moral conflicts of um, what we believe we ought to do, what morality requires, and what it, we care about doing, what, what comes from um, acting because I care. When you have these sort of conflicts between two qualitatively different value scales, um, your emotions will leave you with what Claudia Card calls moral remainders. And when you have moral remainders like that, some failure is inevitable in some cases. It's the reason Tessman calls her book Moral Failure is because uh, you were never going to do the perfectly right thing, right? Either you were going to um, leave, uh, leave the defenseless uh, undefended out there on the internet, or you're going to add to online moral outrage. Right? Like, in some cases, none of your choices are the best ones. So that's sad when I put it that way. I should give you something happy. <laughs> And I promised myself I would end on some happier notes. So one hope is that the outrage participant can uh, change their um, habitual outputs to just develop better online behaviors. This is a hope I, I have that I haven't, I haven't um, got a lot of empirical evidence from my psychology buddies yet. But uh, when I look at Gendler's A-Leafs, for example, uh, remember that they included a representation, um, your affective associations, they're very spontaneous, and then a behavior that results. And I wanna suggest, as other people do, that um, if representations and your affective associations are less under your control, that you could habituate different behaviors in response. Um, mine, the one I've tried to cultivate myself when I'm online is to, um, when, I, when I get the representation of something especially something that makes me feel outraged on behalf of someone else. I have the affective association, you know, oh, friend hurt, must defend friend. Um, I try to pivot to private messaging a friend. Twitter allows private messaging now. You don't have to do it on the billboard on the highway, right? You could just pivot to the victim and talk to the friend privately or the celebrity. <laughs> but uh, I promised a happy-ish conclusion. So I'm going to uh, relate this to the theme of this series too and tell you that anger and hope are related. 
and behavior change can require help from empathetic others. So because I'm doing this as part of the expanding empathy series, I thought maybe I should encourage people to know that sometimes empathy works. <laughs> that uh, T. Wen points to something, he gestures to it because at the end of that um, echo chambers, I'm sorry, yeah, echo chambers uh, are harder to escape than a cult article. A T1 set calls this the thinnest whisper of a hope. And I agree with him that there's just, I'm sure Molly can say more about this than I do, but there's not a lot of evidence that this works on a constant basis. But we know that this works sometimes. That um, anger and, oh, I'm actually quoting philosopher Katie Stockdale, line one. Uh, she wrote a book called Hope Under Oppression. It was came out this past year. I was just talking about a conference this past week. And what she'll say in that book is that um, anger and hope are both, in a way, expressive of basic values. And in a way, they're both rather forward looking. They're expressing some basic desires, some better world you wish was the case, right? Um, even if you are over perceiving or misperceiving, you are expressing anger because there's some way in which you want the world to be different or better. And when we are trying to intervene in people doing that, we could intervene by meeting them where their hopes are, by uh, having some empathy for them. So it's possible, because I started this talk saying, uh, Molly and I are gonna, I think, agree that the answers aren't going to be individualist, individualistic answers that um, what these bad people who take part in online outrage should do is control themselves, right? That possibly one of the better answers to online outrage is that we need the help of empathetic others to correct our overperceptions and our misperceptions. Um, and to, even when we're not doing that, even just dial us down. So um, I have two examples on your slide. Uh, one is unfollow by Megan Phelps Roper. She was the Twitter spokesperson for Westboro Baptist Church. And uh, if that print underneath her book is too small to read, I wanna read it for you. It, she says, I started to feel empathy when uh, someone was interacting with her on Twitter because he noticed that she seemed like a rational, reasonable person who was simply the Twitter spokesperson for um, a somewhat echo chambered organization. <laughs> and because he showed her empathy in her, or her interests and her desires for the future, because he showed her some interest in her well being, she said, I started to feel empathy because this man interacted with me on Twitter. And then she adds, over time, I started to feel like I was becoming part of this community on Twitter. And what she means is part of a different community, part of a better one that would engage in empathy with others. So to an extent, she's on Twitter because she was the spokesperson for outrage. <laughs> and yet it is someone who expressed empathy with her on Twitter who got her to leave the uh, Westboro Baptist Church entirely. Like she's not even a member of the group online or otherwise. The other example I have for you on the screen is one closer to my home. Uh, here in Canada, I have the example of Tara Hills, who was a vaccine hesitant mom, who's been lovely about talking to people about why she was vaccine hesitant and why she changed her mind. One of the reasons she was vaccine hesitant and uh, mind changingly resistant is because when she expressed vaccine hesitancy online, she got a great deal of scorn from online outraged communities. <laughs> Well, the scorn um, made her double down, right? It made her more vaccine hesitant. So the online outrage wasn't helping her to be less vaccine hesitant. It wasn't, um, in fact, it, it drove her further into her own epistemic bubble of people who told her, you're right, vaccines are bad and we're good. What changed her mind uh, was, and again, this, the print is a little small because it's a screenshot, so I'm happy to read it to you. What changed her mind was that somebody got put her in touch online with a doctor who uh, said to her, the first thing she said to me, Tara, was, Tara, I want you to know you're a really good mom and it's totally okay to ask questions about vaccines. So again, it was a really empathetic moment when she, she went straight to Tara's hopes, right? Her hopes for her children, that they would be better off in the future, that they would not be endangered. Uh, as Katie Stockdale would say, our hopes can be fear-filled hopes. And she had fear-filled hopes that her children wouldn't suffer but they wouldn't suffer from illnesses and they wouldn't suffer from vaccines. And for the doctor to meet her where she was and say, I want you to know you're a really good mom 
was the moment that she says that it was like a light switch. It was the day she started changing her mind. I can show you other empathetic answers, but these are just a few. I mean, I'm calling it a happy-ish conclusion because there's no guarantee that this will work. And in fact, uh, I was tempted to put Sarah Silverman on the screen, who um, in response to uh, what Molly Crockett referred to as online hate speech, which is not entirely the same as online outrage, uh, but when uh, Sarah Silverman got online hate speech, gendered online hate speech, she decided, what if I responded with some love and compassion for this guy? And it did blunt it almost immediately. Uh, but as Alice McLaughlin would tell you, uh, that other people found even the opposite works. Like Lindy West got online gendered hate speech, responded with indignation and assertion of her personhood. And that also got the guy to reverse himself. So it's not like I'm thinking, oh, it's, it's empathy that works and not indignant assertion of your personhood. Both of them can work. Neither of them are guaranteed to work. But it does at least give you some hope that empathy might be one of those answers. And that is my happy-ish conclusion. But I'm really looking forward to talking to Molly because I wrote down 50 questions I have for her. <laughs> questions from you first. Really, really excellent talk. Um, any, any questions from the audience about this talk? There were a couple that came up during, uh, there, was all, there was the one you already sort of addressed about what makes outreach attractive for users. There's another one about just, um, with particular politicians like Trump, you know, gaining support through outrage expression on Twitter. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Oh yeah, I can see it in Q and A now. I see it. Before he was banned, it says Donald Trump was able to gain a huge irony intended following on Twitter. Do you think the outrage he expressed on Twitter was a major driver in his high level of social media engagement? Oh, yes. I mean, yes. Yeah. I I think. Um, that is one skilled public speaker. I, I've watched his public speeches with some fascination because he, he knows how to work a crowd, right? Um, one way to work a crowd is to get their feelings going. And uh, as I said earlier, this is, this is actually, this was well confirmed before the internet. Um, both contempt and outrage uh, really do get people, I mean, appealing to people to feel contempt. Like outrage, it gets people to feel pretty great. Like they're pretty awesome. They're righteous. They're up high and others are down low. Uh, in philosophy, we argue about whether contempt and outrage require this kind of lowness criterion where you have to see other people as below you. But, um, but yeah, I think uh, Trump very skillfully deployed outrage in order to build a large community online and in order to, um, whether he was building community or not, in order to get retweeted, because it's just so appealing. And it feels so great to be on the side of the right and the good. Um, I, I'm trying to remember exactly what Molly said, but I remember thinking when she talked, yeah, everybody believes they're justified. I mean, everybody believes they're justified. It's why would you say, I, I, why would you type something and add, I don't feel justified in saying this. Uh, so yeah, I think, uh, I think, I think we all want to share our angry hopes and when we share our angry hopes, and I think there's such a thing, I, I kind of wish Katie Stockton would write about just plain angry hopes. Um, when we share angry hopes, what we want people to do is um, join us, right? So I didn't go on about this in much detail as I thought I would, because I was trying to keep my time short. Uh, but now that I have time, I'm going to add that uh, the number one reason I think a lot of us go online is just to look for company because you could be outraged and indignant at home all by yourself. The only reason to share it online is because you want somebody else to join you and say, like, retweet, I agree, right? So yeah, you only go online to have company. And there you share your angry hopes. You can have at least one person say, I'm with you. And then it feels like you doubled. It feels like you're twice as large as you were before. It's a fantastic feeling. I've had it myself. Yeah, I'm trying not to act like I'm pure as the driven snow. I know I've done online outrage. <laughs> as someone who's also engaged in online outrage, I, I can empathize. Um, you know, one thing you're just saying makes me wonder too. Um, you know, there is some work, one of our speakers later in the series, Stefan Fathiker, has some work on compassion and punishment and empathy linking with increased outrage. And so I'm wondering, especially with some of the recent uh, like COVID pandemic, like public health behaviors and that sort of thing, you know, if the degree to which 
empathy can unlock people from their outra their collective outrage bubbles of belief, but also to the degree that people feel like their outrage is conditioned upon you know, caring for dependent others or having empathy for certain groups. Um, the difficulties that might pose for using empathy as a wedge to unlock outrage, potentially. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I would be remiss not to um, mention Paul Bloom, the psychologist who wrote Against Empathy, right? In which he wrote that empathy is just one of our to tools in our toolbox and it's no better or worse than anger or love or anything else when it comes to empathizing with the wrong people. <laughs> I don't always agree with him and that's okay. But uh, I, I do agree with him that of course you could empathize with the wrong people and that can move you to want to show your empathy with people by de announcing to everybody, I empathize with so-and-so and that's what makes the rest of you bad for not empathizing with so-and-so. So yeah, I don't think empathy is inherently good or going to solve all our problems. Uh, I think it has to have the right target and it will be a more effective wedge when you are working to empathize with people who are expressing morally, morally justifiable hopes, right? When you get to their root hopes, the root hopes are usually not, um, I wanna burn this nation down. The root hopes are usually, I'm terribly worried that my kids are not gonna be okay, right? And if you meet them there, if you find a morally justifiable hope, you can say, I empathize with that hope. And I disagree with you about, you know, the ways you're going about pursuing it. But that did seem to be what worked on a lot of the people in my examples. That may also connect to uh, one of the questions in the side chat here by Cameron. Um, just oh, the perceptions okay. of overlap between the right and the left in terms of values versus epistemic yeah. beliefs. It seems to connect a little bit. Well, that's a tough question. Let me stare at that one, Cameron. Yeah, right and left values, you know, they're not, I would scarcely, I would scarcely compare them to epistemic beliefs um, because right and left values tend to express more more, um, what's the way at least Tessman put it, more pre prescriptive dispositions in advance, right? So they're not epistemic so much as they are, you know, more uh, anterior value, value aligned bases that say, you know, what's more important is something like meritocracy versus unfairness, right? Uh, and because right and left values tend to be those sort of basal values that express your, your um, emotional predispositions, not your epistemic propositions, uh, I think they're a lot harder to wedge free. I think uh, epistemic mistakes are far easier. They're, they're, I shouldn't say far easier. Nothing online is easy. <laughs> um, but I do think epistemic um, misperceptions and overperceptions are... Uh, provide much more opportunity for those sort of empathetic wedges, because you can say it, your basal values are, are those I can empathize with. The, um, the information you've attached to them to, to figure out what to do about them, that's where you're going wrong, right? So yeah, I think, um, I think dislodging people from their left-wing or right-wing commitments is gonna be, um, I'm trying not to say, I'm trying not to say anything too negative. I was supposed to be the cheerful person. Uh, it's going to be a much more hopeless project. That was me being positive. There is, uh, Cameron appreciates your cheerfulness. Um, oh, good. Thank you, Cameron. Um, yeah, in other, I've getting a lot of presentations lately on pessimism. So this is my aim to be less pessimistic today. Uh, but yeah, I, my, most of my presentations on online speech are about online shaming. <laughs> and I was, Really pleased to see Molly say that online um, outrage tends to lead to online shaming, which again, I don't always think is inherently bad, but it is almost always worse than people think it is, right? The magnitude is almost always worse than online shamers think it is. So um, I have nothing all that positive to say about the moral risks. Oh, and thank you for the reading recommendation, Cameron. There is one more question here in the Q&A, and then I want to make sure we I'll leave some time for the two of you to sort of inter intersect and uh, sort of compare notes further. Uh, Emily asks, for people organizations who engage in social media professionally, what are the moral responsibilities at play to change the culture of online outrage? How do these balance against other moral responsibilities? 
Also, do the moral responsibilities experienced professionally differ than the moral responsibilities we experience personally as we engage in social media? Oh, that second. Wow, Emily, you're also is a tough one. Let me, let me take a deep sigh as I think about the second half of that. Uh, I think for uh, people and organizations who engage in social media professionally, and I'm excluding uh, social media engineers and social media corporations because they are a different animal. They know what their responsibilities are. It's up to them to do them. But uh, for the rest of us, uh, the, people like, uh, the people like the people on this call who are, you know, who are engaged in this sort of quasi public way or semi-public way. Um, I think our moral responsibilities to change the culture of online outrage are to, um, I think our moral responsibilities include pivoting everybody's attention to victims. Um, and without using, because negativity bias <laughs> pulls our attention, uh, is it possible to just pull attention to victims in a way that doesn't rely on negative language? So, um, there are, there are speech acts that would be a little more effective that don't involve negative language. Imperatives are speech acts that will also pull your attention but not involve so much negativity. And the second half of Emily's question, I'm pondering simply because, let me look at my, the second half again, because um, you asked, do the moral responsibilities experienced professionally differ than the moral responsibilities we experience personally as individuals engaged in social media? And the reason I'm spinning my wheels over that so hard, Emily, is simply because, uh, well, because the upshot of everything I was saying is, I don't think we have a lot of control over our personal, even when we're acting professionally. So our professional responsibilities involve a lot of our slower, more deliberative and more um, principled commitments. I think we can carry those into situations very, very uh, skillfully with practice. And I think it takes practice. And I don't think we can help even when we're online professionally, um, having those automatic intuitive affective responses and wanting to type, that is outrageous. <laughs> so I'll, I'll engage with, uh, Facebook, is, um, Facebook is a haven for philosophers. Like there are a lot of philosophers on Facebook. I know it's not cool to everybody anymore, but philosophers never left us where we find each other. And just yesterday, a philosophy friend uh, said, oh, Whatever, whatever principled commitment somebody wrote, she wrote, I am livid reading that. Um, I talked to her like in private chat afterward. It turned out she wasn't nearly as angry as the word livid. <laughs> Molly's laughing. She's like, yes, that's it. Um, but yeah, I mean, even when we're acting professionally, if you're hearing everything I'm saying, we're still personal. We're still persons. And this is what persons do. We express the outrage. So I think we need to practice helping each other um, check our outrage and helping each other be more empathetic and be more in touch with each other. Again, I, I don't think any of the responses are going to end up being individualistic. What you need to learn to do is just control yourself responses because um, the individual, individualistic responses are what we've been trying for like 10 years even. And I can't help noticing uh, just stay off Twitter. Just don't be online. It's not, it's not an effective solution. I know, I know Someone always recommends what you need is a detox. You just need to take a break. And of course, walking away from the keyboard helps. It does help. Um, and it's a really temporary solution, right? Especially during the pandemic that uh, walking away from the interwebs was not gonna last during a pandemic where most professionals have to be online <laughs> and where you're like, where the proximate trigger is next to you at all times, right? I use this as an alarm clock. So yeah, I'm, I worry that on the one hand, uh, individualistic and uh, personal solutions are not solutions. They are temporary fixes at best. And on the other hand, we're going to need to individually get more practice with um, carrying our principal commitments into our online situations and um, checking on each other, helping each other when we see each other expressing outrage. So I did, I did actually intervene on purpose when I saw someone say she was livid. And I was like, well, this is a philosopher move, but it helps. It helps. So um, whether you're a philosopher or not, this helps everybody. I, I, uh, by livid, do you mean, and rephrase it. I know Molly's, Molly's already laughing at me, but it helps. Philosophers uh, long, love to say, well, I don't know if you mean livid. They mean livid. All right. 
I apologize for any questions I'm neglecting, but I think I no, got that, them all. That's all the questions we have at the moment. You know, yeah. one thing that I think both of your talks conveyed was just some of the challenges dealing with outrage. I mean, I think both both of your talks nicely highlighted some of the broader concerns about like the social structure in which outrage is being deployed and expressed. Um, you know, one thing that you know, mentioning Bloom, I mean, going back several years, you know, one of the one of the articles I assigned in my moral site classes was Pizarro and Bloom's response to Height's work. So it's this older paper, about two decades old, and it talks about it is very individualistic focus because it's talking about emotion regulation strategies we can use to navigate our moral emotions that are framed in a very type one or system one sort of way. Mm -hmm. So changing how we think about our outrage, how we define our outrage, but also changing the input, like changing the situations around ourselves in ways to preclude what emotions are elicited because once they are expressed, it's hard to control them. And I guess I was just, you know, a lot of the questions that have come up have been about how do we use others to regulate our own emotions? How do we think about the interface between the individual and social self? Yeah, and you know, everybody, William James said it a hundred years ago, and I don't think we've improved on it much. We totally use others to regulate our emotions. That is, it's why you go online instead of saying quietly outreach in your basement, right? It's, it's why you go online. We use others to regulate our emotions and we always have. Uh, in fact, if anything, we go to others in part to find out what emotions to have. So it's not like we have emotions first and then we go to people. It's that we go to people and then we also have emotions, that it is just this endless biofeedback loop. I don't think it's a coincidence that William James was both a philosopher and a psychologist, right? That I think if there's something, if there's something uh, philosophers and psychologists have in common, it's our concern that ultimately you are, you're never alone even when you think you are that even when you're tweeting alone in your basement on your phone, you're being shaped and reshaped by others and you're shaping and reshaping them. And that is of course why I'm saying this in a worried tone because we are just constantly taking moral risks every time we interact online. And I'm fine with that. I mean, that's, that's moral life. That's the nature of the beast. Uh, but it's, it is and should be really worrying. And I think T. Wen is right when he ends his article on uh, echo chambers saying the ability to intervene with empathy is only the thinnest whisper of a hope that even that won't always work because it is more comfortable to stay in it than to leave it. Yeah, that's a thread that I, I want to pick up on actually. Um, and this is my main question for you, Catherine. Um, and it it's, I, I really like what you said about, you know, we don't, we don't just go to others to regulate our emotions. We go to others to figure out what emotions we're supposed to have in the first place. And this is something that I think is really radically changed by social media in ways that I think we're still beginning to grasp. Um, and this has to do with um, what you called um, mixed imaginal relations and is related to a concept in, in media studies called context collapse. The idea that you know, you know, our our sort of emotional impulses, this this impulse to like share an emotion with with other people who we know to figure out if that's the right emotional response to have. Like, I think that most people when they're on social media, like, have the sense that like, oh, I'm going to my people and I'm like, you know, trying out this attitude about some issue where maybe I'm like actually not deeply committed to that attitude. Maybe I'm highly uncertain about that attitude. And I wanna get the feedback to figure out like, is, you know, is this the right take on this issue? But because of this phenomenon of context collapse, because, you know, especially, you know, on Twitter, you know, your tweet once it's posted can, you have no control over where it goes to. And, you know, I think that this is, while I'm skeptical that all forms of online interaction, you know, um, outrage participation are epistemically or personally transformative. I do agree that like those cases that I think could fit Lori Paul's definition are those where you have someone who's making a very, you know, tentative or not very well thought out claim. And that tweet gets taken way out of context or is shown to an audience that was really different from the one intended. Yeah. And this individual faces this like 
extreme storm pylon that could result in them becoming radicalized very quickly because, you know, if, if that individual could have been one side or the other on an issue and then gets an overwhelmingly negative response on the like anti side of that issue, then it's only natural to sort of accelerate towards the, the pro because like you just received all of this, this hatred from, from, yeah. you know, strangers on the internet and like, you know, I, I think that the, the discussions around cancel culture, just to go back to that, like oh, yeah. unhelpfully blur the lines between public figures getting flack for problematic moral positions and ordinary people who are just like, you know, offhandedly trying to figure stuff out and, you know, maybe have like 50 followers and all of a sudden are like, you know, I mean, Justine Sacco is like one of the, the, you know, sort of prime examples for this. And like, you know, I think there are a lot of examples of, of, of ordinary people, you know, potentially becoming radicalized, you know, because of this fact of social media, which is totally different from how communication operates offline. Like normally when you say something offline, um, yeah, John Ronson, exactly. Yeah, John Ronson, uh, so you've been publicly shamed. Exactly, yeah. Um, like, if you say something to other people, like maybe you'll be overheard by at most, like <laughs> yeah. you know, a handful of other people. But like this phenomenon of like, you say something to an intended audience and then it just like other, it just like goes around the internet. And, and we're not set up for that. Like we're, we're not, not set up for this. It's this, the, the, the online community overruns what we've we've evolved to manage and it just moves on in and once it's moved in you you don't get to just move it off on your own right yeah i uh i wanted to like emphasize when you said you're skeptical they're all transformative i am too i think it's it's always an only a risk but i really worry about that risk because since it's always an only a risk someone who um hasn't experienced it yet. Well, think, so you see, it's not a danger. I don't get radicalized. I've been online 10 times. I'm fine. So they keep taking the risk, right? And you don't know when you get sucked into the bubbles. You don't know when you get sucked into, um, not only am I not alone, but I have found my people. And it turns out I'm a different person than I even thought I was. I'm a member of this, well, they would never call it an echo chamber. I'm a member of this echo chamber. It turns out we are us. And uh, yeah, the fact that it's a risk actually makes me more worried <laughs> because- that means you can go online a hundred times, a thousand times and not know when you're risking it, not know when you're yeah. risking that sort of epistemic transformation. Although I think actually, I really like your framing of it as risk because that also highlights another factor in all of this that could further increase epistemic injustice, broadly speaking, which is to say that if you are a person who faces more risk you know, in your life, yeah. you might be more risk averse to these kinds of speech acts online. And I mean, you know, what I presented at the end of my talk, you know, if you're a person of color, if you're a woman, if you're queer, like you are already getting disproportionate, like your risk is higher yes. already. So this is a way in which the structures of social media like exacerbate problems of testimonial injustice that we already see in the real world. Uh, it's a kind of like online testimonial smothering, right? Like, like, a, a, you know, I'm thinking about Kirsty Dotson's frameworks here, um, like where people silence themselves because they're afraid of getting pushed back by virtue of, of some feature of their identity. Yeah, indeed. I have a so some of us are more risk averse than others, right? And I'm I'm not so risk averse, so I'm comfortable being online. Uh, but I have a friend who's more risk averse than I am. And when she did, she ventured to go on television and she got so much online hate that she she does do testimonial smothering now. Now when she sees something wrong, she doesn't even tell somebody they're wrong. Um, she, she doesn't even correct the most minor factual error online because uh, she doesn't ever want, again, the amount of weirdly gendered and sexualized violent language that she got that, that women disproportionately get. Totally. Yeah. It, I, I could say many depressing things about that. Mm, yeah, yeah. I was, I mean, I'm very risk averse and, and one, one feature of what are you doing here? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know. Like this is a, you know, it's harder to be taken out of context and on, on a vehicle, <laughs> but, but 
Yeah, I, my my like imaginal relationships are all like online haters. So I hardly ever tweet except for about like very, very like bland things because like I have so many examples from our research of how this can go badly, badly wrong that I'm like, yeah, I, I have to I can't touch that. I have to admit, ever since I did that online shaming paper, I've spent less time on Twitter. It's Twitter in particular. Like I go on to announce, hey, a new issue of the journal has come out and then I stay off it for a long time. So yeah, I'm missing... I, they let me know I might be missing my notifications. I said, I don't know if I'm missing them. No. <laughs> yeah. I laughed when I laughed during your presentation. If you saw me laugh, you probably didn't, you're busy, but uh, you said at the beginning, like you did your research with very little help from the social media companies themselves. And when you got to the end where uh, I, I could see why you're saying, not only do they not help you, but they actively subvert <laughs> our ability to oh yeah understand anything about online outrage have you succeeded in getting help from social media companies since well i mean so and there are different forms of help and there are different forms of like obstruction and our team has experienced a variety of these uh types so like um you know, the first is data access, right? So I mean, Twitter is actually the best of all the platforms in terms of providing access to their data. Weird. But all data sets are constructed, right? The idea of like raw data is a fiction. And so, you know, we're like, we in the research community just kind of have to trust that what we're getting from these APIs is representative and like is what they say it is. And we actually had a really <laughs> rough experience um, with Facebook where they had, um, you know, made accessible this data set of all of the URLs that were shared at least a hundred times on Facebook. This is an insanely huge data set and Amazing. required um, a bespoke computing environment to be developed by the Facebook engineers to you know, protect user identities and privacy, which you know, we all agreed to and, and was fine. But after we had spent a year and a half analyzing the data um, and some teams had already like published papers based on this data set, uh, Facebook, uh, reached out to all of us and was like, our bad, there was a coding error and we only gave you the data from users who have liked um, at least one, like and had liked a sufficient number of political pages for us to be able to categorize their political ide ideology, which was one of the variables in the data set. And so we thought we were getting, doing analysis on data from all Facebook users. And it turned out it was only data from highly politically engaged Facebook users, which for the kinds of research questions we were studying is like obviously a big problem for yeah. like the conclusions that we want to, want to make from the data. And like, that error was only discovered um, because one of the researchers was like doing a particular analysis oh. and doing these like weird. And so, it, you know, it was like, when you think about the volumes and the complexity of data sets that researchers and computational social science are working with, combined with the neoliberal cultural of, acad cultural of academia, that's like, you got to publish like 900 things every yeah. day and the time pressure and, you know, <laughs> like stress of, of, of that, like, you know, it, and the, the disincentives <laughs> that tech companies have to spend a lot of researchers or to spend a lot of resources, helping researchers like do work that's potentially going to make them look bad. It's just yeah. a recipe for disaster. And so like, Thankfully, I think um, like researchers in this community are finally starting to um, to uh, collectively organize to start to to work together towards you know demanding um, you know essentially I think we just need government mandates Good. for you know tech companies to be required to transparently share their data um, so that this research can be done you know because like it is you know like our you know epistemic public health really depends on understanding how this all works. And right now it's just kind of, it, yeah, there is a, it's a trash fire. <laughs> yeah, our epistemic public health is not, not at its best right now. So I want to, uh, I know we're running up on time. Um, you know, I think we've covered a lot of grounds and, you know, if there's any, um, don't see any other last questions. Um, you know, I think there, there are so many interesting things we could keep talking about in terms of the degree to which this sort of interaction with outrage in the online space is fatiguing or taxing. You know, it's something that our lab has been super interested in. Um, 
Yeah. But also, you know, like the trade-offs, the moral trade-offs is, you know, wh whether it can motivate collective action or destructive dehumanization. I think these conversations will likely continue. I mean, do either of you have any concluding parting thoughts about the science and ethics of outrage uh, to close out today's session? Or any other last questions for each other? If I had a last question for Molly, it would just be uh, whether or not your your investigations are, st are starting to sort out um, different types of outrage. Because I did find myself thinking when I was prepping for this that outrage, personal outrage on behalf of someone being attacked or something might be really different from political outrage when you see Donald Trump tweet something and, you, and I tweet back at him. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we haven't, like the closest thing that we've done is, is this looking at this sort of specific category at the intersection of moral outrage and hate speech. And I do think that that is, is a category that's likely to be detectable and show unique you know, patterns in terms of behavior and, and, and online consequences. Um, so we are looking at that. Um, I um, I am really intrigued by Maisha Cherry's recent framework about different types of, of rage and how they relate to um, racial and other forms of social justice. Yeah. Um, so you know I'm 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 interested in thinking through more of that. And the challenge, like the technical challenge in in studying different forms of outrage online, is like the very, very rough category of like outrage or not outrage is getting 76% agreement. And uh, yeah, um, right. and, How do you code for and that? that's pretty good, but like, you know, getting more fine grained than that is gonna be challenging in particular because I think you're gonna have a huge confound between just like the topic content, like the key words that are gonna be associated with political outrage versus, you know, other, other forms of outrage, like you mentioned. Um, and so you could potentially build models that would that would be pretty accurate on your on your training data sets, but be really bad at generalizing out of sample because like like what you know like there, there just would be a confound between like the 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 quality of the outrage that express like the motives of the person expressing the outrage versus um, like the specific like topic or content of that. Um, awesome. But I mean, it's certainly something that can be looked at in the lab. Um, so yeah, that's that's sort of, that's my answer. <laughs> that's a good answer, that's a good answer. Yeah, and like, I think, yeah, my, like my, so I, I guess my closing thoughts for you are, Oh gosh, there's so many. I wish you had another hour to talk. Um, <laughs> um, but um, I, I'm going to be thinking a lot more after this conversation about the different forms of epistemic injustice that can arise from just like the structure of social media environments. And I think, um, yeah, and in the the personal transformation idea, in, in particular, is like. I think a really fascinating way to think about like the intersection between like the individual intervention and the structural intervention. So I mean, like yeah. maybe my, my last sort of question for you is, you know, does it make sense to think about interventions as like individual or structural in the case of social media where like the structures are operating on individual behaviors? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, and like you, I want to emphasize that our we don't have a lot of individual control because of the well our technological overlords and and how much their design and their development is controlling the context in which we operate. Right. So I think yeah I think uh, individual interventions are they are a form of um, better than nothing rescue. I don't think I do a lot of non-ideal theory. Like nothing I nothing I do in my ethics work ever says I have a way of solving all the problems of the world. So really, what I'm describing when I talk about these little like empathetic moments, especially if you're correcting just some sort of epistemic overperception, uh, I think everything I do just generally describes how to how to engage in some sort of interpersonal relationship, even online, because. Individual rescue might be all that individuals can do. And that's more than nothing. That's, you know, that's important. I like, I like that Tara, uh, that the, 
the vaccine hesitant mom was helped. Mm-hmm. I liked that the Westboro Baptist Church lady was helped. And it means there's tons of vaccine hesitant moms and Westboro Baptist Church members who are left <laughs> and in their echo chambers. Um, and you can't help everybody individually. That's gonna have to take a lot else. But I do wanna, I do wanna add before I leave that, um, that I'm not alone impulse is it's utterly defensible. Like I'm not really criticizing people who don't wanna be alone. None of us want to be alone. So I think we enter for individual reasons. The individual reason you enter is you don't wanna be alone and you don't know what you're getting into when you get into the structure. <laughs> That's, that structure is not one that cares about your individually not wanting to be alone. The structure is, it exceeds what you can control. So yeah, I think, I think my, uh, my ethical recommendations are all uh, on the individual rescue level because I don't think we can do a lot else. I think we're really, there's, I think there's a real way in which we are meaningfully oppressed, <laughs> like billions of us. Wow, that is a whole other talk. I should stop there. <laughs> well, thank you both. You know, I, I do think there's a lot of, hopefully folks who are seeing this other live or once it's posted online, will be able to take a bit away from this. And I think for both of your sets of work, I mean, I think what's most interesting, at least in my view, is just you know, the way in which we're often not fully digitally literate or equipped to fully understand the implications of our emotions online. And thinking about how best to manage that is, I think, going to be a perpetual challenge. Um, yeah, for those of you who are interested and want to talk more with either of our speakers, as a reminder, we are on May 2nd having a short or informal conversation. Any of you who are into this, are op- it's open to the public, we are in- interested attendees. Um, and oh yeah, Aslan, the question, we did bring up, you know, what, right. So the, why the content to produce more outrage or more attractive. Um, good question. In the interest of time, um, does anybody have a quick answer? Why are some <laughs> outrage contents more Quick attractive? answer is just that, um, you know, moral outrage signals that there's something morally relevant in our environment and morally relevant information is really important for our survival. So. It grabs our attention. Great, great, thank you. Um, well, uh, anybody who wants to keep chatting with Dr. Crock or Dr. Norla, please do feel free to sign up for that webinar. It's May 2nd, it's a couple of weeks from now. Uh, thank you both. Uh, this has been great, a great way to kick off the series this year. And uh, thank you all for your great questions. Thank you.